Hi, everyone. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, my name is Teal, and I am the Interim Assistant Curator of Programs here at the Williams College Museum of Art. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our series of virtual curatorial close looks. And I'm especially excited to be introducing today's program featuring our Mellon Curatorial Fellows, Jordan Horton, Destiny Fillmore, and Nicholas Liu, who will be talking about the reinstallation of the exhibition Remixing the Hall, Wickmas Collection in Perpetual Transition, which they recently co-curated together with senior curator Kevin Murphy and curatorial assistant Elizabeth Sandoval. To begin, I would first like to take a moment to recognize that my colleagues and I are all presenting to you today from Williams College, which sits on the ancestral homelands of the Stockbridge Muncie Mohicans, who are the indigenous peoples of this region now called Williamstown, Massachusetts. Following tremendous hardship after being forced from their valued homelands, they continued as a sovereign tribal nation in Wisconsin, where they reside today. As we come together today, we pay honor and respect to their ancestors, both past and present, as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space here for all. And as always, we encourage all of you joining in from various regions to learn about the indigenous peoples of your own areas. Now, before I turn it over to our wonderful presenters, I have just a few logistical notes. Today's conversation will run about an hour and we'll be taking audience questions during the second half of the program. But we welcome you to send your questions through at any point using the Q&A feature um, at the navigation bar down at the bottom of your screen. And if you have any technical questions or need any assistance throughout, please send questions along to our staff using the chat feature and we'll do our best to help you. Live captioning is also available during this program and can be turned on or off using the CC button at the bottom navigation bar as well. This presentation is being recorded and will be available afterwards on the museum's website and YouTube channels. Now I will start sharing my screen again and turn things over to Jordan, Destiny, and Nick. Let me unmute. Hello everyone, it's a pleasure to talk to you all today about um, Remixing the Hall and the work that we've done in this recent um, rendition of it. Um, for, for context, um, Remixing the Hall comes from the DJ culture of remixing and taking the original and, and adding and subtracting things to kind of make it your own. Um, with that, we recognize that this collection is in a perpetual transition as we acquire new objects and conduct new research. And this show demonstrates an exercise on how to improve the museum and curatorial practice as it relates to the greater world. Um, in addition to that, and just practicing on our curatorial skills, we remixing the hall kind of came about during the pandemic, at the start of the pandemic, um, and the demands for a social reckoning across the country. Um, Nick, Destiny, and I are super honored to be adding to the trail initiated by Horace Ballard, Elizabeth Sandoval, and Kevin Murphy. And with that, we add the themes of hybridity, divine encounters, uh, nature and growth, domesticity, and healing. Um, each of us will talk about in, uh, certain new aspects of the show that are, are new to this uh, rendition of it. Um, Till, can I have the next slide, please? So the aspect of show that I really focused on is what I call the growth wall. As you can see in this video, the back um, left. Yes, so there it goes. And so this was kind of the start of it in which this kind of prompts the changes of the, of the show since the works on paper have to be swapped out every so often to give them rest. And, and this was the wall that had to be replaced. And I am super honored that I was able to really take um, priority on this project. Um, this comes from the, my pandemic hobby of gardening. Um, I thought that I wanted to add to the pandemic being one of the main themes throughout the, the show and, and gardening was just very therapeutic to me. I think it taught me a lot. Um, I thought this theme also conceptually aligned with other themes of the gallery, such as the water room, which we'll talk about later. I think that gardening and planting is a applicable metaphor for life. Um, and with that came the themes of growth and unfavorable condition, growth and abundance and vibrancy, 
as well as like something celebratory, but also exponential growth um, involving youth, but also involving death and aging, which all I think have a profundity to this idea of growing and, and how growing doesn't stop even if you do. Um, some works that I want to talk about in particular in this close look, um, as we'll see throughout this, is the Kara Walker, which was uh, the Kara Walker um, type, yes, the Kara Walker Growth in, ne in Negress Notes, uh, Slavery Reparations Act, in which um, was the first work of the wall. Um, I think as the first work I saw in the collection and I was like, wow, this is cool. And it's also called growth. So it really put those, um, it, it put that, that idea together. Um, Kara Walker, her series tends to be in a antebellum style, uh, tends to be watercolor. And this image in particular, which will come up very soon, um, I thought was a representation of that summer. Um, with each head noting a generation as it appears right now on the screen. Um, each head is a note of a generation and I thought the grayscale and the cloudiness as well as the heads um, seem to be in several different states, states of agony, profundity, meditation, and yet this humanoid flower still grows further, um, which led me to the, the sub theme of growth as radical and reminds me of the proverb I've just heard throughout my like education of, they tried to bury us, but didn't know we were seeds. Um, I, I think this was just a really great starting point of this wall. Um, and I'm just really happy that it made it throughout the entire process of, of editing and taking things out and putting things in. This really stood really clear to me. And here's a very detailed shot of it here. And oh, here's the next thing of, um, I want to speak more about the Samuel Joseph Brown um, boy in the white suit. I think this represents a curatorial leap for me in this process of this is one of the images that don't include any flora in itself. Um, but I think this kind of hones in on the theme of growth and youth and, and the relation to that. And I think that children are really um, precious and noticeable stage of growth. Um, and I, I think of all artists to represent this, I think Brown is a great example because he was employed as a public school teacher, a public school art teacher, while also producing art for the federal art project under the Roosevelt administration. And he worked as a substitute teacher in Camden, New Jersey in the early 1930s and began his career full time um, in the school districts of, of Philadelphia in 1938. And one of Brown's um, dream was for the glorification of children, especially black children, um, to see themselves in a light and in, in a positive light to motivate them to do well, and especially when representation in the 1940s for, for black youth wasn't um, always prominent, wasn't always positive. Um, just a huge fan of the watercolor preference that that Brown has in most of his illustration in his most of his paintings. Um, and this one in particular, I think, has just a beautiful angelic glow of this this white suit and this boy kind of looking fondly and stoically and hopefully um, in the distance. Um, this was a pleasure to do a salon wall. There's 10 works total and Though I talked about these two, I, I can talk fully about more. Some of my favorites were Diversion, Child in the Landscape, engraving by Aginia Sadler, um, which I think connects really well to the Divinity Wall nearby. Um, Greenpoint Common, Cape Town from Peter Hugo. I think it's just literally a great example of like the phenomenon of nature and the resistance that nature can have, as well as um, uh, the birthday cards from the Eugenie Prendergrass uh, collection, which I think is a really fun and whimsical reminder that like youth and, and growing is a celebratory thing. Um, thank you. I'm super excited to be able to, sh to share that with you and to keep the momentum going. I want to pass it off to my colleague to talk about another edition of our show, The Banal Wall. Thank you so much, Jordan. So 
As Jordan just said, this is what we've been calling the banal wall. And our interest here was to locate the everyday utilitarian object within our collection. We've done that through several groupings, and this is one of them. This is shoes, a set of shoes. We were trying to play on tangible three-dimensional representations of banal objects versus more conceptual 2D renderings. So here you can see these bataleke, which are shoes worn by Yoruba Oba or King, and they're meant to communicate his power while the Andy Warhols prints that are right next to them uh, were made with mass production in mind and communicate via text with really fun, uh, quippy sayings like Uncle Sam wants shoe instead of Uncle Sam wants you. So again, we were interested in pairing something sort of uh, really grand and regal, formal, serious and glamorous with something that is also glamorous, but perhaps a bit witty and funny to uh, have a, a really complicated uh, conversation about uh, objects and their relationships, but to also facilitate movement through this imagined interior. Um, Till, would you mind uh, going to the next slide, please? So here at the other end of the wall is this case full of vessels. And we wanted to think about the universal utility of objects across geographies and periods of times to kind of one, demonstrate the depth and breadth of our collection, but then to also tie into the larger uh, you know, concept that's driving this exhibition, which is to think temporally and geographically amongst uh, themes. So you see here, this is a kajama made in modern day Nigeria, and this is a vessel meant to hold wine, and it seems to have been made from a gourd. To your direct left is a Wedgwood vase that was made in 1920. Uh, the blue small glaze bowl that you see is from the Song Dynasty, and next to it is a Kantharos from 500 or 300 BC uh, that was made in ancient Greece, and also a wine holding vessel. And at the bottom, you saw the egg server that was made in Kolkata, India uh, in the 17th century. So all of these objects are connected uh, by the fact that they are vessels meant to hold something, but also uh, by the fact that their owners are unknown. And so their everyday use is ambiguous. We can make assumptions and assertions uh, about what kind of content that something might have held. But honestly, uh, there are a lot of things that we can never know and will never know. But we do know that these objects belong to somebody, that they had a function and a utility, and that their presence in our collection today represents the stewardship of those who made and owned them. And we're continuing that legacy at the museum. Thank you. So now I'll pass it over to Nick to talk a little bit more about our, our stewardship over objects in the collection. Thanks so much, Destiny. Um, hi, everyone. I'm going to talk generally about uh, this next room of remixing before diving into uh, a closer look at a couple of the objects. And so for the first time, remixing is extending it to the adjacent gallery, uh, to the Prendergast galleries, which we were just in. And we try to gesture to that by painting the walls of the entryway the same color as the walls in the galleries that we just saw and keeping the label colors the same as well, um, which is more apparent uh, if you come see the show in person. And there are also thematic continuations as well, particularly with the banal wall that Destiny just talked about, um, this idea of everyday objects, and particularly in this gallery, found objects, um, which are objects and materials that artists don't necessarily make themselves, but incorporate into their work. Um, and there were several other strands of thinking that as well, including the desire to display installation works in the galleries, highlighting rec recent acquisitions and the sense of embodiment or activation of the pieces, by which I mean that many of the works in this room uh, were or are meant to be used um, in a sort of performance, which I'll get to more when talking about the specific works. So what we've been looking at here is uh, Andrea Zatel's a to Z living unit customized for Petty and Frank Kolodny. This was constructed in 1993 and is one of the first works that Zatel made um, in her career long engagement with these compact living units. And she currently lives in the desert in California, right next to Joshua Tree National Park. And she makes these small abodes that are basically like tiny houses. Um, but she began this decades long series by making works like, like this one, while she was working in New York City uh, and had very little space in her own uh, apartment, which was also her studio. And these living units are meant to actually be lived in by their owners um, and Zatel works with them to customize them. 
And so, for example, um, the blankets on the bed in this piece um, were also made by Zittel. And there's also a, a plaque that's above the bed uh, that is by Jenny Holzer. And so in this unit, as you can see, we have uh, a TV, light, several drawers, and on the back, a mirror. Um, and uh, so we positioned it we positioned it in the gallery so that visitors can move all around it um, and uh, to sort of look, to make it look inviting and, and homey, but not too inviting um, that, that visitors don't, don't uh, climb into it and try to live in it. But uh, moving on to the next work, which uh, you just got a glimpse of, uh, thank you, Teal, is uh, placed in the center of the room and is one of um, Guadalupe Maravilla, who is a Salvador, uh, El, El Salvador uh, born artist's um, disease thrower sculptures. This is disease thrower number 10. Um, and this is one of the works that was acquired last fall in the acquiring art class, which I think we'll talk more about in the discussion. Um, but here, this piece is actually made out of uh, a couple of different components. The gong on top is separate. Um, and the stuff in front of the rectangular frame is, is separate as well that you can see here. It's an amalgamation of these dried loofah sponges and sea stars. Um, and as well, you can see here in the bottom right uh, is a molecular model for ice, which gestures both toward the natural elements uh, as well as the border between UX, the US and Mexico, which the artist crossed as a child when fleeing the civil war in El Salvador. And this is all held together with this cotton substance um, and glue mixture that's been hardened. And um, here you can see right now, actually, there is a clear face shield or visor. And so this piece is meant to be worn as a headpiece and performed with. And Marvi was diagnosed with colon cancer as an adult and turned to indigenous medicines and healing practices. So the artist plays the gong um, in his disease thrower works, not by hitting it, but he sort of traces the back of it, which creates these sound baths, uh, which are these resonant full body experiences. And he's also had recent shows at MoMA and uh, the Brooklyn Museum, which I believe is, is still up. Um, and, and there are videos online of these performances, but the students in the acquiring art class had the opportunity to speak with Maravilla last semester, and he seemed receptive to the idea of doing a performance um, with this piece in the Wokma Galleries. And so we're hoping that he'll visit sometime soon. Um, and we're just generally very excited to have this work, um, which was made in 2020, and I think also finds new meaning um, in, in, in the COVID pandemic. And so these are a couple of the objects that I've chosen to go uh, into more detail about in this room, but I'm happy to answer more questions later on about any uh, other of the works in the Q&A. Um, and now we're going to go to our last work, um, which Jordan is going to talk about. Thank you, Nick. Um, similar to the Madavia, uh, these two works that I'm talking about were also acquired in the fall class acquiring art. Um, this, these two works, Alligator Creature, which is a sculpture piece in the front, and then Wasiso, which is a video in, that is behind it. Um, one, yes, we'll talk more about acquiring art in particular, because I think this is just an amazing feat on the class and that deserves its own space. Um, but these two works are done by Alison Janae Hamilton, who is a contemporary multidisciplinary artist. And her work focuses predominantly on film and installation to create uh, immersed environments, often as spaces which um, mediate on life in, rural, in the rural American South. Um, she's influenced by her upbringing in Florida and Tennessee um, and draws from natural landscaping, historical reference, as well as mythology. Um, and just has a huge range of mediums for her practice, such as um, photography, film, sculpture, and installation. Um, so about the, the video work itself, um, Wasissa is a 22 minute, 14 second single, um, single channel uh, video with sound included, um, which invites, Hamilton invites you to kind of dive into this world that she builds. She submerges the camera upside down um, and captures just so much like life within this, this river. Um, and while the video captures this like ethereal possibility of world building, it also captures a really dark and historic past and present. Um, during the 19, 
No, during the 1850s, um, enslaved Black people were forced to dig transportation canals through the Wasissa River. Um, once again, this is in Florida, um, which that canal would allow for um, passage for cotton from Georgia to, Flo to the Florida Panhandle um, to reach ships at the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and the canal was never used um, and is geographically still labeled as the slave canal. Um, and so with this, Wasissa tells this very complex story of mythology rooted in personal and historical uh, memory. Um, kind of being the narrator for this, we have the alligator creature um, seen here um, in which as a part of Hamilton's sculptural practice, um, one of the things she's really into is uh, taxidermy. And for alligator creature, Hamilton did not use the, the organic matter um, of like animal skin, but instead opted for like a skinless taxidermy, um, which is this white bear exposure. This would have been, in this is what is inside, like this is what taxidermy is stuffed with basically. Um, the alligator is adorned with pastel grapes and paper and stands upright, um, kind of calling viewers in to engage with it as well as the video that stands behind it. Um, Hamilton's made many creatures as we saw with the acquiring art class when we went to the gallery, the, the Marion Boski Gallery in, in New York, we saw that um, she has other creatures that represent the ecology of uh, Florida as well as Tennessee, but Florida specifically. Um, and to acquire both Wasissa and alligator creature together, um, they can be shown separate, but it kind of just is very harmonious together. Um, both the class that the, the group that acquired her as well as um, Hamilton herself really appreciate that, that they were acquired together. Um, the alligator creature kind of acts as a narrator and guides you to immerse into this world. And as she mentions before, um, as I mentioned before, one aspect of her work is environmental justice and climate concerns. And therefore, um, that is thought into her work as well, down to the fact that um, there is a, a carbon emission uh, set offset price that's included into the acquisition of this work. So um, Destiny, Nick, please chime in if I missed anything. Um, not that you missed anything, but a fun fact that I learned from Gail, who is one of our visitor services associates after our initial tour, was that some of the plant life that you can see in this video are actually invasive species. And so it's another added layer uh, that I'm sure Hamilton is aware of, but that um, is really enlightening for me to think about her engagement with ecologies and environmentalism and to essentially have a work that documents the uh, disruption of an ecosystem that she holds so dear to her. I just wanted to quickly add that um, if you're able to, to come see this work in person at WICMA, there is a sound component as well. Um, which is just this like very lush um, bubbling and, and, and movement of the camera through water, which really creates this immersive experience. Um, other than that, uh, as mentioned, this is in our thematic room, the water room, which was in the first iteration of remixing, but this was just a, an essential add on once we acquired it. And um, yes, that, that's, that kind of concludes the water room and, and thank you all for listening to us and I will pass it back to Teal um, to, to further the programming. Thank you all so much for this really wonderful introduction to the show and for also braving the wild new territory of speaking over video. I know that's not easy, but you made it look seamless. Um, just a reminder to our audience that you can please send in your questions at any point using the Q&A feature, but I will maybe kick things off and we can just show some additional footage of the galleries here and some lovely activation with the student group we got last week. Um, and just ask you guys to talk a little bit more about your curatorial process, both the experience of working collaborati collaboratively, excuse me, um, not only the three of you, but also with Kevin and with Elizabeth and how together you thought about uh, experimenting and approaching different ways of displaying the variety of objects that are in this show. Uh, 
Um, I suppose I can begin to offer an answer because there are many, many. Um, one of the drastic differences between this iteration of remixing and the one before it, which um, Horace Fowler, Elizabeth Sandoval, and Kevin Murphy all curated, was that they were curating almost entirely via Zoom. Um, but we had a really uh, wonderful opportunity to be in person uh, for discussions of the checklist when we're trying to uh, decide what we wanted to include, the kind of thematic uh, groupings that were emerging, um, and also the chance to visit the objects themselves, many of them, not all of them, to get a better understanding of their presence and aura. And I found that to be incredibly helpful in uh, doing our best to communicate uh, again, these ideas and themes related to the, the exhibition, but also to the objects themselves. That was really enjoyable. Yeah. Oh. No, I'll go for it. Okay, so thanks. Um, this started as sort of a, um, a switch out of, of the works on paper uh, with Jordan's growth wall. Uh, because works on paper have to have to be rotated uh, more frequently than than some other works, but it expanded to to the banal wall and to uh, the gallery next door, with uh, the the activation and, and um, installation works, uh, and and so it was really great to sort of think about the existing themes as Destiny mentioned that were in remixing before and and to create our own themes, but also to think about how they engaged and intersected uh, with the, the different sort of groupings that were already in the, the Prendergast galleries. And, and that happened with conversations with Kevin and, and Elizabeth and with each other. And, and so it was really great to sort of, those sort of early brainstorming stages were, were really fun. Um, I think this brought out a lot of problem solving and um, creatively and, and like, stylistically um, for in, in regards to talking about the salon wall, the growth wall, um, at, that's a salon hang and, and I had to think like what works well next to each other. Um, like originally the Kara Walker was next to the, the birthday cards and that didn't feel like they mesh well together, but also thinking design wise of um, there is a Kinjilo Niao uh, lithograph and the top of it is curved like the paper is curved and so to put the hugo on top of that which is also has a gesture of curve was like a really cool design um concept to get through i think it was also just a matter of um trusting in myself but also trusting in my team I, the, the original wall i had in mind looks nothing like how it looks today and that comes with the help of of nick and destiny and and kevin and and liz gallerani and so many more people so um i think it was just a really um, I learned a lot in this experience of, of taking risk and, and just trying different things out, as well as um, not thinking only about the wall itself, but the rest of the room and, and making sure other things complement each other um, and keeping, it is, it, of course, it's going to look a little different since at this point, five curators have intervened in some way, but still trying to keep this like curatorial integrity in mind of, of like one mission and, and one like principle. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and so many of the works, I think one of the beautiful things about this show, um, in addition to having your amazing curatorial vision um, brought to it is that so many of the works in the show came through acquiring art, which Nick, you mentioned a bit before. And I'm not sure if everyone in our audience is familiar with this unique program. So if one of you or all of you can maybe share a little bit more about acquiring art, um, and what the class does and how it contributes to our collection here at WICMA. I can, I can start, um, but Jordan Destiny, please feel free to, to add anything. Um, so Coring Art is, is a class that uh, is offered every uh, couple of years, I think, and last time last fall, and is taught by uh, Kevin Murphy, who's a curator who we worked with on remixing and an economics professor and uh, we had a mix of undergrad and graduate students in the MA program of art history in that class last semester um, who get into groups and make proposals uh, for new acquisitions for the museum. And the three of us were not enrolled in that class, but we, as part of the curatorial team and, and working closely with Kevin, 
um, work with the groups. And, and there's, a, there's a trip uh, in November that, that we took uh, to New York to go to the galleries and see these works in person. And so um, the two Hamilton pieces and the Maravilla, a disease thrower uh, were two of the, the pieces that were uh, proposed through that class and, and ultimately acquired. And there are two more works, um, uh, an abstract painting by Mildred Thompson, which is up in uh, the second uh, floor right now. And then a photograph by the Korean artist, Jung Jing Lee, um, which I think will be up soon as well. Um. Just to add, I think, uh, what about this this iteration of the acquirement course that was so special is that we had the opportunity to get almost um, everything or, or at least one object from each of the five groups that presented. And so uh, I think that's unprecedented and, and it just is a testament to the dedication that the students had to their proposals. Some of them had visited New York prior to the group trip and had already been uh, on, on several visits to engage with uh, artist or with the galleries and uh, also in the reading room that Nick mentioned there are two other works that were acquired from the previous iteration of the class and so it's a really wonderful opportunity to have a, a space dedicated to reflecting on the successes of the students um, and, and all of their presentations. Um, I think too just also being a student I, I think that I can speak for the three of us it's just really interesting and fun to watch these students acquire it and, and be able to use it in real time, especially like just for me as a contemporary enthusiast. Um, for example, the Madavia, like I, I'd never experienced his work before and, and to be in on this group acquiring it and then to see his shows pop up at MoMA and, and the Brooklyn Museum and just see him reach this notoriety is such an active way to engage with the art world as it is now. Um, I think it also is a great opportunity for the museum to learn what um, what students are are interested in and, and keep us um, like relevant and up with the art market and 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 like very in social ways and 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 um, just kind of seeing artists before they kind of hit this uh, this stardom. Thank you all. I was going to ask another question about. Um, scale and particularly how you approach scale in 35. But we have a question from our audience. It's maybe we can tie in um, to add, which is asking you to talk a little bit more about the work by Wendy Redstar, which is a very large scale work and so kind of ties into my question. Um, I think, as you can hopefully see from the video, you all have beautifully spaced out 35. I mean, there's these large scale works, um, which are all very distinctive and you've given the room such um, a lovely flow where there's breath and space for each of the works to stand on their own and for the audience to engage with them on their own, um, but then also for them to be in dialogue with one another in these really interesting ways. So sorry for piling two questions onto <laughs> into one, but maybe if we can talk a little bit about the, uh, the Red Star and then also just scale and how you all approach that room more broadly. I can, Jordan, do you want to talk about Red Star? Yeah, I, I do. <laughs> um, Go for it. Red Star is like, that piece in particular is just like one of my like proudest moments being here. Honestly, I had the privilege of um, being kind of in charge of the acquiring of that. And um, after it was acquired, I feel like there was just a mission to make sure that it was shown and shown with like integrity and shown like in fullness and not necessarily to the boundaries of it being from an indigenous maker. Um, but it deserved to be shown in so many different contexts. Um, and yeah, I think that was one of the first pieces that we really established being in 35 of this is a big piece and it, it needs a big room to be in here. And um, everything else around it has to kind of demand a presence in its own way too. Um, yeah, I just wanted to lead off with that and, and just how the Red Star kind of prompted this, this like, theme of like largeness as well as collecting, which um, I imagine Nick will kind of discuss a bit more. Yeah, thank you, Jordan. Um, so this is Wendy Red Star's um, No Good Dirt Plateau Wild Horse Ridge, uh, which is made out of 
30 drawings that are mounted of horses that are mounted on marbled paper. Um, and each drawing has, is, is based on a, a different historical letter drawing. Um, and letter drawings were made by indigenous individuals, especially uh, in the Great Plains, on paper um, coming from ledger books or accounting books uh, made mostly during the late 1800s. And uh, each horse you'll notice has a leash or, or a lead um, denoting that uh, the, the horse is, um, belongs to a particular individual. And uh, when Wendy uh, visited Wickma last semester, she told us about how taking, uh, or I think, I think she used the phrase getting horses uh, from other tribes is, is considered a, a rite of passage. And so here, Wendy, who is herself Crow, is also taking these horses from the original ledger drawings to make her own sort of group. Um, and on each drawing is, is written the name of the horse, the tribal affiliation, and the institution that houses the original ledger drawings. And so in our curatorial process, we were thinking about these ledger drawings as sort of found objects, which Wendy then incorporates into her work. Um, and this is a, a, a really, really large scale piece and uh, it's on uh, the only wall in that gallery that, that can fit them. And so it really anchors the space, I think on that side. Um, and so that was really the starting point um, as Jordan was alluding to from which we, we thought about the, the other kind of assortment and, and arrangement of the objects in that gallery. Yeah, and I think some of the preliminary conversations that we were having as a curatorial team as a whole were thinking about big objects. It was, it was a bit of like a ingest or a joke, like, oh man, there are some really large objects in the collection that we'd like to see. And uh, the space in 35 afforded that opportunity. And so the Zetel, the uh, Red Star, and the Theastra Gates that are, and, and the Marvia that are on view are all more recent acquisitions. And so the timeliness of their installation is, uh, is in part kind of tied to that, to their arrival to the museum. Um, but the, the placement just uh, sort of uh, happened organically. We were trying to have material relationships happening. So the Zetel is sort of away a, a from, but directly across from the, the Astor Gates to think about their use of wood in drastically different ways. Uh, and we wanted to have the, the stacking that's happening in the Lorna Simpson sort of across from the Red Star, but also being intercepted by the Marvia because they share this uh, like structural or general shape. And so, yeah, the, 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 the selection of works was kind of coming from an interest in large scale sculptures that hadn't had the chance to be exhibited, um, but also, uh, and then their placements were kind of happening organically depending on the relationships between the objects. And it took a lot of uh, small tweaks, a little four inches to the left, four inches to the right uh, to decide ultimately where things would go. But we're glad to hear that the placement feels uh, good and that the flow seems right. Yes, it definitely does. I think it's um, one of my favorite rooms in the show, though that's hard to choose. Um, a question from our audience. Did some of the newly acquired works come with restrictions and or instructions about how they are to be shown and for how long? Um, I think the, I, I don't think so. The only one that might come to mind is perhaps the Red Star. Um, Wendy Red Star had said, uh, I think this work had previously, previously been installed with like the paper itself onto a wall, but then Wendy had worked with a framer, and I believe that's based in Brooklyn, to find a framing solution that uh, still gave the effect that the other installation of the work had. And so I think that's that's one of the only parameters that I remember, uh, but no, um, Wasissa, um, it, one of the great things about that video in particular is how flexible its installation is. So it could have been the size of an entire room or uh, on, a, on a small monitor. And so we arrived at that sizing due to uh, spatial limitations. And uh, yeah, I think the same, the Marvia also didn't have any uh, particular restrictions on it. So this all just kind of came down to what fit best in the space and, and what we thought would work well. Yeah, um, sorry, Teal, if you could go to the previous slide, which I think is a, a larger, a more pullback 
view of, of the room um, where you can see there's a tell on, on, on the left and then uh, Lorna, Lorna Simpson and then uh, the Marvia and then um, the Astro Gates is Shushine One. Um, the Marvia in particular, but sort of all of these works, we were, they didn't come, I don't think with specific instructions as, as Destiny was saying, but we wanted to sort of honor their sort of uh, presence in the space and, and be able to, to have visitors move around them, um, all sort of all around them um, and, and to, especially if Marvia, for example, comes and, and activates the piece to, to have space for him to be there and for other people to, to gather in the space as well. Um, but yeah, we wanted to just sort of space them out in order to kind of have uh, space around them and, and, and so that they can really live in, in function um, by themselves. Thank you all. Um, one thing I, I think is um, so special about the show is that it kind of holds these different variances of, of, um, of daily life or of, I guess of life more broadly. You know, you have the everyday as this theme that runs throughout the banal wall, of course, but um, even Jordan, you know, talking about gardening as this daily practice um, and how that led you to the growth wall and then thinking about the way that found material is a kind of um, a common link between the different works in 35. And then you have, you know, some a, a wall I've seen a lot of students and a lot of visitors engage with is this, uh, the Virgin Mary wall, which I can actually go to that slide, um, which is directly parallel to the Banal wall. And I guess I was just wondering if you all could say a little bit more about how you kind of hold these two very sort of opposite ends, you know, the quotidian, the the banal even, and then the divine in this show um, in this way that feels really uh, obviously intentional, but feels really um, like a, a, a just a perfect conversation, a necessary conversation, um, but does it maybe wouldn't occur to all of us to put those pairings together and have them be in that space and one another. Um, I, I can hop in and respond to this. I think the original thought was uh, for the rooms to sort of be on either side of a spectrum uh, from the everyday in the banal to the divine to sort of illuminate how the everyday can be divine and how the divine can be banal or part of an everyday practice. Um, so this installation, uh, there was a painting where this central figure is that had to be taken away. And then this sculpture, I believe it was previously installed in uh, Bloedale, which is where the uh, were the were, were, were objects from the medieval collection or medieval objects from the collection are on view. And so that was a really practical transition that was led by Elizabeth Sandoval um, to meet a need, but then also to continue this conversation about representations of the bandana um, throughout time and medium. And so, yeah, I, I think uh, what was really important was thinking about the way that uh, as individuals, uh, especially during the pandemic's uh, early days, we're, we're facing our interiors in a way that we hadn't before, and how objects that might have been, you know, otherwise ignored or or, or undervalued became incredibly valuable. Uh, so much so that they might have like had a, a they might have had a deep resonance and and became an essential part to one's everyday practice in a way that they weren't before. And so I think that was the intent behind this uh, conversation that's happening across the gallery. And there's also the presence of pretty like regular and banal objects inside of the art on the Marion walls. So the painting that's on the cinder box to the far left, there's a basket there that has fruit in it, the, the clothing that these figures are wearing, all the way to the right that's not pictured and then this larger Spanish Baroque painting. There are also like little bits that there's scissors and, and other baskets and things, just these small objects that uh, we might encounter in our own homes that are also being pictured and connected with these divine figures. So. I believe that, that was a, a good chunk of the thinking about this relationship across the galleries. Thank you all. Um, if, 
Oh, we have a question from our audience. Let me go to that. Are your intentions and inspirations communicated to the in-person visitor, excuse me, who may not be on this video via the wall labels, um, which is maybe a great way to start uh, talking about interpretation and the wall labels and how, um, how you use those as a space to continue your curatorial thinking. Um, something I think is really special about remixing uh, comes in its wall labels in which there's a lot of research done um, on the artist in particular, uh, especially um, if it's the case of an older artist and where they're born isn't necessarily the, the name of the present day location um, that's acknowledged as well as kind of indicating places that they've studied and traveled and lived and worked to kind of get a better idea of of how that could embody and how, how that could um, manifest in, in the, the work that they make today, to today or the work that, that stands before us. So I think that um, that's something really special about the labeling of remixing in particular. Um, and with that, because that's so much research, there's not as many chat labels um, for individual works, but it's kind of generalized into the, the theme of that section of the show. Um, in which I, I hope is like general enough and still allows for like personal interpretation of each object and, and each theme uh, to kind of be one of your own. Yeah, ad adding on to that, I think the last thing that any of us want to do is sort of give a, a sort of like definite um, or constricting um, interpretation or, or sort of meaning uh, to the objects. Um, and, and, and we want visitors to have sort of their own experience. And we've written group labels, Destiny's written some really beautiful labels connecting some of the, the objects uh, on the banal wall. And we've also written labels, Jordan's written a, a general one for, for the growth wall. And, and also um, there's sort of an, an introduction to the, the 35 gallery space. Um, where we talk about sort of the, the themes and connections that we were interested in um, and, and what inspired us, but we also um, want to make, want to have visitors make connections, their own connections um, with the sort of experiences and observations that they bring. Um, and in particular to, to the banal wall, there's, there's really a, a, um, a, we as curators want visitors to sort of think and, and reflect about the objects in their, in their own lives through these kind of quotidian uh, banal everyday objects that are kind of sort of elevated in this museum space. Amazing, thank you all. Um, we're just about at time. And so I wanted to ask if you have any kind of final ways of wrapping, um, you want to wrap up our lovely talk today and last words you want to leave us with. Um, and maybe I can ask a somewhat cheeky prompt of what you see for the future of remixing if or just the collection in general how you new themes you'd be interested in exploring or future curators to explore um, or for audiences to look at when they come to to see our collections on display i don't have an answer for that question <laughs> but i do have a, a just a few remarks and, and really thank yous more than anything to give uh, to the entire curatorial team, but also to the entire collections management team, especially to Brian, who's our chief preparator, and to John, who's a preparator. Their um, presence in the galleries during install was just unbelievably helpful and inspiring um, in thinking about the way that we wanted to visually communicate our ideas and the relationships between the objects and I, I very much appreciate all the things that we got to learn with them. The process is very long and extensive, of course, and tiresome on both ends, but in the end, it, it resulted in a rather successful installation. I second all the thank yous. Um, I, I think we're, we have a bit more time until the next uh, rendition of this. And so we're kind of gonna put our heads together uh, soon to think through possible themes and um, the things that we need to you know, take away for 
uh, conservation reasons and the things that we want to add because um, we couldn't add them here or like we kind of put a pin in them. Um, just a huge thank a, a huge thank you. This was I think the first time for all of our curatorial interventions in at Wicma, and it was just like a really um, pleasant process. And and just once again, really got those like wheels turning and and like pushing us forward in this craft of, of curating. I, I think I never really. I think I realized, but it, this just really emphasized the responsibility curation has um, in telling stories to the public. And, and I just really hold that responsibility really dear. And um, it's also like a collaborative one. So I'm just very thankful to be able to collaborate with Nick and Destiny and, and uh, the curatorial team and, and everyone beyond the, um, throughout every department who was just very encouraging and uh, very supportive as we went through this process. Yeah, I just want to echo echo both of um, Destiny and Jordan's thank yous, um, and 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 thinking about the future, uh, the the works on paper section um, has to be rotated a, a couple a couple times a year, um, and we as as we mentioned we we focused on on a lot of new acquisitions, um, but remixing the hall is also very much about mining and, and thinking really deeply about objects that have been in our collections uh, for a long time and maybe haven't seen, um, haven't been on view in the galleries um, in a while or, or if, if ever. And so uh, we're beginning to think about um, some of those uh, objects and, and, and themes. And so I just invite everyone to, to come see, see the, the current iteration of, of remixing and to come back for, for the new ones in the future. Thank you all. Thank you for this beautiful show and this wonderful conversation. And thank you to our audience for joining us and for sharing your questions. Um, we will see you all soon. Thanks for having us. Thank you.